Welcome him. Woo. So in case you aren't familiar with this incredible artist, he is a conceptual artist and photographer who has captured the faces of many celebrities around the world and prominent executives in Silicon Valley. Um, his work addresses the, the nature of identity, value, and human currency, and has been exhibited throughout the world. In, in fact, you're going to be a, an, an exhibit next month, correct? Correct. <laughs> Where is that going to be? Tell us about it. Uh, at the Hermitage in oh, St. Petersburg. My gosh. So, so cool. So I want to ask you, how did you get started in, I know you don't like to identify with a photograph, as a photographer, but how did you kind of get interested into that? Was there, you know, a moment in time or a person or? I, I was surrounded by art as a, as a, as a child. My father uh, was not particularly uh, sophisticated uh, with respect to his knowledge about art, uh, but he had friends uh, who were. And I think uh, exposure at an early age, uh, you know, I'd be at somebody's home and I'd see something on the wall. I don't know what it could have been, let's say a, a Henry Moore etching or something, and, which I did like, actually. But that's not a good example. So, so there'd be something that maybe I didn't like, and I'd say, uh, I'd say um, you know, I don't like that. And they, 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 they wouldn't let that slide. They'd say, well, why don't you like it? You know, well, it's something I could do. They're like, oh, could you really? But you didn't do it, you know, decades ago. And, and, and uh, uh, how does it make you feel, et cetera? So I, I had that kind of uh, early education about art appreciation. Um, I was also interested in science. And so I studied uh, in school microbiology, cognitive science. Uh, but I was always making art. Not identifying as an artist, really, but, but m making art. And, and now that when I look back at it, I realize, like, oh, that's interesting, because I, I, I don't know if that's normal. I don't know if, if people who are not artists have a period of their life where they're constantly making art, but yet not identifying with it. Um, and so I found that uh, uh, I, I, I was in, in the early 90s uh, in Germany, uh, moving between East Germany and, and West Germany, uh, supporting myself uh, with, with uh, mixed media art, uh, I was, I was uh, doing these paintings with ash, uh, and I was also exploring photography. And very quickly, um, I, 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 I found myself getting uh, commissions for my photography, mostly portraits of, of, of people. Um, and and that, was, that was how it all started. Uh, and and uh, when, when, I, when I, I came back to Los Angeles around 1990, and uh, a prominent uh, curator from the Metropolitan Museum of Art, Henry Geltzahler, he, uh, he, he saw my work uh, and encouraged me, especially with the photography, to, to continue down that path. Uh, he introduced me to his friend David Hockney, which was amazing at the time. I remember being in awe of him. And a couple of years later, doing some work with, uh, with Hockney. Uh, and again, uh, Geltzahler uh, was, was, uh, was very encouraging. And, and so that's what I, I did primarily for a good 10 years, photography. Yeah. And you photographed really incredible people, celebrities, executives. What is your art for, you know, you, you, the way you capture them is amazing. How do you get them in that state to get that perfect shot? <laughs> What's... I work quickly. I, uh, I, I like to keep people out of their head before they have a chance to manipulate the moment and turn it into a lie. Uh, also, probably I have to work quickly so that my own ego doesn't flood in. Uh, I think that's what it's all about, mitigating ego. Uh, and showing something that's honest, uh, removing the masks, uh, the masks of, 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 of persona and even reputation. Not at the expense of the way people look, though. And th that's not, I mean, that's, I'm just fortunate that m most of the time people like the way they look in the photos. Um, and and just trying to find that balance of uh, uh, strength and vulnerability. And I think when people see that, they, 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 they responded to it. And so, like in Hollywood, for instance, and, and because I think how quickly I worked, that had a value to, uh, to, to celebrities. It's true. It's, it's interesting how you said that, getting into your own mind. You're saying, oh, do I look good at, or do I look natural or all that stuff. What is your, who's some of your pe favorite people that you have worked with and photographed? You know, at this point, I, I kind of look at them all as just one face. But I can remember at times thinking how, you know, how cool it was to be in the presence of Kofi Annan or Lou Reed or, or David Hockney. You know, I don't know. Uh, yeah. It's not that I've become like kind of blasé about it. It's just the thing that I try to access is so universal. It has so little to do with the individual that uh, it's got a lot to do with like therapy for myself. 
so that it really doesn't it doesn't make too much of a difference. But I've certainly met some really cool people. Yeah. yeah. And you also photograph things. So I want to talk to you about mm. this celebrated potato. I don't know if you've seen this, but his, it sold for over a million dollars. And I want to talk to you about kind of how, what inspired that, but also the story of um, how you came about the story of the potato. And when you were selling it, how did you go about, you know, a million dollars is a lot of money. How did, what was the story that you told them that, you know, maybe inspired them or, you know, um, I, I photograph a lot of objects, and, and my treatment, I think, of, of objects and people, uh, it, it's, uh, it's the same. Uh, I try to remove myself from the equation, uh, and hoping that uh, there's something of my own essence uh, that's reflected back in the, in, in the subject. Um, the potato, for me, is just a proxy for something else. It's a proxy for the human experience. It's, uh, uh, and all my work, is, it's a recurring theme, no matter what the medium, this idea of the proxy. I mean, the photo is a proxy for the real thing. Um, the potato uh, is, this, is this, this, this thing that is pulled from the earth. It's covered in dirt. It's not particularly expensive. People take it for granted. And just the process, I think, of uh, making a portrait of a potato and putting it up on the wall in front of the, in front of the viewer, uh, again, hoping that they're able to see something of themselves in it. Uh, it's just, it, it, it's, it's, it's an exercise that, that I perform myself, and, and, I, and I like to encourage other people to do it. Um, but, why? Well, what, what else did you want to know about the potato? Uh, oh, how did I, yeah, I didn't, I didn't try to sell it, actually. Uh, this was just a piece that I felt like really exemplified everything that I liked about my own work. Uh, and I had it on the wall uh, in, in our home in Paris. And uh, a client, a friend, client, who had um, already, he had a, 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 another piece of work uh, and a commissioned portrait, he said that, um, that he wanted it. Or he said he liked it, I'm sorry. He said he liked it. This was over dinner. And, uh, and then with time. See, there was a narrative that I got him drunk, but that's not, that's not the case. Uh, yes, he had some wine. There was wine had, but this was not a part of a master plan, you know. Uh, and then, uh, but yes, after another glass of wine, another one, maybe like two or three, so he wasn't drunk. Um, he said, you know, I really must have that. And, uh, and the price just came out of, it was a function of, it, it wasn't a number just pulled out of the air. It was a function of what he had paid for other works. And now he wanted to take off my hands what I think was the most important work, <laughs> you know, uh, up to that moment. So that was the prize, and it was like it was a couple of weeks later before he committed to it. Very yeah. And now you have been working on "I Am the Coin." Can you tell us about that that new work? I am a coin. Um, I think I have a picture for "I Am a Coin," somewhere. Um, so on the heels of that, uh, it actually took a while. It was about six months after that actually happened before it was leaked to the press, not by me. Um, and there was a global hysteria around this, uh, this potato. I've always said, like, if it, if it weren't a potato, if it were like an avocado or a carrot, I somehow don't think it would have received the attention. But there's just something about, again, that, 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 that something about the potato, and the, particularly that it was dirty, that, that Upset, upset people. It did upset some people, but it ended up being like it was on a game show on Ellen DeGeneres' show and uh, Secretary of the State of the White House, uh, George Stephanopoulos on Good Morning America. He, he actually championed it. He said it is a good-looking potato. And, and I love that. And I love that your art is provoking a lot of conversations. A lot of it's know, odd debates. though when it, it's odd when when it's put out to the you know sort of the, the non-art community, right? The, to the masses, they have a totally different take. Yeah. Understandably. You know, uh, how do you? How can you? Or do you want to control that? Do you want them to think, however, or you kind of want to guide them and to say, "Oh no, no, no! This is kind of what I was trying to portray." You can't control them, yeah. and I think if you try to control them, you, then you're, it's gonna—it's bad enough as it is. But if you—if they got a sense you were trying to control it, it would get really ugly. I received, no, no joke, at least ten thousand emails, at least, and. Some were really sweet and nice, and others were, you know, you suck, yeah. you know. Um, or I could do that. I like the people who, who's, <laughs> who say, you know, you're, you're not even technically good, and I can do that with my eyes shut. And then they would send me a picture they took of a potato, and I'm thinking, 
Ah, right, come on, you could do better than that. I mean, it, like, if you're going to do that, at least, you know, but anyway. So, and then, and then, I mean, we could do 45 minutes just on the feedback from the potato. The woman, I, I guess she, she wouldn't mind if I said this, this letter, like a 3,000 uh, word essay about how uh, when she, w she was with her husband and they came across a potato that was the shape of a heart. And by the way, I received hundreds of heart-shaped potato pictures. I didn't know there were so many heart-shaped potato pictures, but it's a thing. Um, and she said, and, 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 and my husband passed away, and, uh, and then uh, I ended up, times were tough, and we got evicted and uh, ended up losing the, um, the refrigerator, the freezer that we kept that potato in. But when she saw my potato in the news, it brought her husband back to life. I mean, that's, that's powerful stuff. I don't, I don't want to make fun of it, especially if she somehow would see this, but that's impressive. And then you the, never know how you're going to affect people. The people and then the other 5,000-word essays about the Illuminati, and uh, you know, they see symbols in the potato, and I, they know what I'm really doing. And, you know. so, and it's interesting, because I had a discussion with, with uh, esteemed curator Hans-Ulrich Obrist about this. And, and there's a German tradition of presenting uh, the public's feedback alongside the work. And at some point, I just haven't gotten around to it yet, that has to take place. Yeah. It's, 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 for me, it's more interesting than the actual work. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so what, what, this next piece that, that's oh. presented on here, you know, what inspired this? Was right. it right after the potato, or was there a set in not, between? Not, not right after, but let's, the, 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 a couple years after. Um, understandably, it's just the way things work. People, the attention starts to move from the artistic value of your work to the monetary value of your work. And, and uh, it's a, it's a double-edged sword, and, and I'm, I'm fine with that. But at some point, you do start feeling commodified. You kind of wish that weren't the case, but that is the case. And, and so then I started having a little fun with it, imagining that, that I'm a coin. And what would that look like if I were a coin and, and I wanted to put myself in the hands of the masses? And there was just an immediate connection there with blockchain. Uh, a technology which I'd been uh, involved with uh, and interested in since around 2013. And it also happened to be at a time where, uh, I don't know how many people in the audience know what an ICO is, I guess in Silicon Valley, uh, you know, people do. Um, but a company, you know, wants to issue a token uh, and sell it, uh, you know, uh, presumably it has some utility or maybe it's some guarantee for future equity. Um, and I wanted to create 10 million tokens or virtual artworks that were somehow connected to me. So I tried to draw logical threads between myself and a virtual token, and, and what I came up with was drawing my blood. My wife's a doctor, that was easy. Um, and uh, I, I made these 10 million virtual artworks, which are divisible uh, to 18 decimal places, which means that they could actually end up in the hands of billions. Uh, and uh, it, strangely, after the fact, I realized just like a crypto, cryptographic algorithm works uh, where the, if you have the private key, you can deduce uh, a wallet address, but you, if you have a wallet address, you can't deduce the private key. Um, I took the contract address uh, that references my creation of all these virtual tokens. I made a rubber stamp and I printed 100 physical artworks with my blood. So. I say that the physical artwork could not have a meaningful existence were it not for the creation of the virtual artworks. The virtual artworks could exist on their own, but then that would defeat the purpose. So, so when somebody, I give somebody uh, an Ayama token, I send it to them, uh, I, I really see this as a piece of me. And, and so I have a whole body of work now around, around that, uh, around uh, this tokenization of the self. Amazing. And, it, and so you have how many copies of this? Uh, well, there, are, there are 100 versions of the physical artwork, okay. and then there are 10 million uh, tokens. Wow. Very cool. So how, can you tell us how you got in, involved with you know, being in art and in tech? Kind of what is your love for tech and how you infuse that into art? I mean, tech is just, uh, it's, an, it's an interest. I'd also like to be clear, just because someone brought it up earlier, somebody said to me, it's, it's just so great to be so passionate about something like I am about my work, but I, I, I'm not passionate about it. That's the funny thing. I'm passionate about this. I'm passionate about conversation. I had a breakfast this morning. I was passionate about that, passionate about a lot of things. I'm not passionate about my art. It's an internal obligation. It's something I have to do. And I know this because a couple times in my life where it's more about photography than it is the other, the other work I do, but 
if I stop for a, a, a given period of time, things fall apart. I mean, fall apart like really bad. In the last time it happened, I was homeless. That was 13, 14 years ago. And I don't really understand exactly why. And I don't need to, though. I just know it's a truth and I don't mess with it. Um, so, uh, yeah. What was the question? <laughs> How do you... I was thinking about being homeless and I got all bummed up. <laughs> Aww. That's interesting. I, I think that's very... It's kind of meditative for you. It's therapeutic to, to go in and, and photograph these types of things. Um, I was just interested in, you know, how you like to infuse technology into right, your work. Right, right, right. So, so there are two different sort of sides of the brain, maybe. Maybe not actually sides of the brain, but two different parts of me. One is really interested in technology as a, as a means to uh, solve problems. Uh, and then there's the side, the, the part of me that uh, chooses art um, as a means to find higher truths. So I have a background in science, and one of the reasons I stepped off science is that the, 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 the questions that I wanted answers to, I couldn't answer with science, and I didn't believe could be answered by science. Um, and, and art brought me a lot closer to finding answers. It's sort of an asymptotic thing. You kind of get closer, 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 but you never actually get there. But I, I, I felt it was, uh, I, I was on a better track with, with art. So those two, those two uh, sides of me, or parts of me, when they come together, it's no secret that that intersection of art and technology is, uh, is, is, is a really exciting place to, to be. I mean, it doesn't always end up uh, with, with uh, you know, something truly elucidating, or, you know, but, but for me, uh, it's, it's, especially lately, it has, it has been. And, and for me, I, when I have, when, when I have uh, tech or, or blockchain integrated in with my art, it's not... I, I'm not referencing it for the sake of referencing it. I'm using it as a method. I'm using it as a tool to achieve, you know, to achieve something. Yeah. And we were talking earlier about um, the future of exhibitions and galleries. As you as an artist, how do you like to share your art? Do you like to be within an exhibit or do you, you know, like to share it online or what's the best way for you to, to, I, to reach audiences? I'm, I'm, I'm a... I'm a bit odd in that sense that I didn't uh, come up in the gallery system. Um, again, I was doing a lot of photographic work, conceptual photographic work early on in the, uh, in the, in the early 90s. And the galleries that I wanted to be uh, potentially part of, just because I thought they might validate me in some way, or, you know, uh, I, I never saw them actually as a way to, uh, like, a, it was not a business thing. I, I, I imagine, I imagine some people think of the, the gallery as a, as this, uh, uh, you know, way to bring in money, which I guess it is. Uh, but I also know a lot of artists crave the validation of the right gallery. And I think I may have had a little bit of that, but the galleries I wanted to be part of were, were not dealing with photography. And at the time, they, they were sort of biased against photography. And while all the photo photography galleries in the world wanted me to join, jo you know, represent me, uh, I didn't want to be part of that. I, I saw it as a sort of a ghetto that quite possibly could lead to me being, you know, stamped uh, f f till the end of time and as a photographer and nothing else. I didn't, I, and I don't understand to this day many of the, not all, but many of the photography galleries, how they curate their work. I mean, some I do. I don't yeah, know what am I talking about. There's some great photography galleries. But, but if you go to a photo fair, it can be very confusing. Yeah. What tie, well, you know, the, the, yes, the common theme is that everything was photographed. But it all, some of the stuff, it just doesn't make sense that it should all be inhabiting the same space. And of all of your pieces, I mean, you have lots of photographs and works like this. Probably, what, what is your favorite? Or do you, it, does it matter on part of time, like, oh, I like it today, or maybe I like something more later, but what is your favorite piece that you've worked on? Hmm, that's one of those questions. Uh, usually it's like, who's the, who's, the, who's the person you photographed who you thought was the coolest, or like, who was, who was the easiest or nicest? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. It's probably what right now. I'm really excited about what I'm working on now. What this, are you doing now? Well, this project. It's the, it's the and, and you know, I, I imagine within five, six months, I won't be working on all this. But uh, this, this, this using the blockchain as a method, using uh, the blockchain to create proxies. Um, I'm using these contract addresses, the wallet addresses, uh, to, to uh, represent something a little bit more complicated. I f even though they, m 
for now, they look kind of long and confusing. I actually think that they very effectively uh, have the power to distill uh, an emotion uh, and remove a lot of the noise that I think sometimes gets in the way. Uh, and, and this is why we use symbols in the first place, is to, uh, to accomplish that. And what's next for you? Well, next is, uh, is uh, uh, on May 24th, I, I install work uh, at the Hermitage Museum uh, in, in, uh, in St. Petersburg. And that's really exciting. That's very exciting. <laughs> So, Will it be a lot of your photography and oh, different works? Can you see I have. Some? I should probably show a couple things yes. here. Um, or maybe it's at the end. Uh, it's, well, that's what's here. Uh, this is, it's it's going to be an installation of many of these, uh, these canvas sacks with wallet addresses uh, imprinted on them. Not in blood, but in black ink. Um, and in those wallets on the blockchain, I've deposited a certain amount of Ayama coins. So pieces of me. Uh, but I've thrown away the, the private key that you would normally use to access uh, these tokens. So in a sense, they're in suspended animation, or I prefer to think of them as virtually dead. And that's why I call it personal effects. Um, and and there's gonna, there are going to be a number of those uh, installed uh, at the museum. Um, and just for those who, who have seen the work uh, here at, at, at the If So What Art Fair and, and don't know what this is about, Yellow Lambo, uh, is a 10-foot wide neon uh, sculpture. Uh, that is a, another uh, blockchain contract address that references a token I created on the blockchain called uh, Yellow Lambo or Y Lambo. It's, one, it's a unique token, not 10 million of them, there's just one. And uh, for those who might have a little interest in cryptocurrency, uh, there's a certain group of people that I think are very enthusiastic and uh, they declare to their tribe on social media, hashtag Lambo. Uh, as if, uh, you know, that's this aspirational uh, uh, symbol of success identity. And, uh, uh, and, th and that's where this work uh, comes around. So if the Lamborghini is a proxy for uh, success identity and my uh, token is a, a second proxy, this is the third proxy. So I like to say it's triple distilled value. Very, very cool. Well, I'd love to open up to you all um, with any questions that you have for Kevin. Hey, Kevin. I had a different question, but now after you said about the homeless, can, I, can you tell us more about the experience and what did you learn as an artist from that? Or did you come out a different person? Yes. Uh, so uh, how one becomes homeless, I suppose everybody has a different path. Um, I, uh, you know, I went from... I think, I think, I don't know, I, I went from driving a big Mercedes to being homeless. Um, and that's fine. And, and what's interesting, and somebody told me this actually right in the, mi in the middle of it all. They said to me, and it's hard to imagine at the time, they said, this is probably the best thing that ever happened to you. And that's kind of hard to appreciate at, at the time. But, you know, I had a lot of, I had created this uh, unsustainable um, kind of complicated world of responsibilities and artificial obligations and they were all my own making. They'd, I didn't have to have a life like that. I created this um, this burden upon myself which manifested strangely. That, it's beautiful actually how it manifests. You're, if, if, if you can't consciously come to the place where you realize you've got to change these things and, and, uh, and move forward in a healthier manner, um, I think your subconscious actually uh, takes over your body and physically just breaks you down. And so I was in a place where I was, uh, things that were building up uh, were building up to the point where they just imploded on, uh, where I, it was like an avalanche on top of me and I fell into a hole. And I was just, I was joking about it. It was not a joke. Like, those are some of the best times of my life. I had no responsibility. I wasn't responsible to anybody. I mean, people kind of, when, 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 you, when I don't know, probably a few people here have had a similar experience, but when your life implodes, yes, you might have a couple people who come to your help and, you know, but a lot of them run. 
a lot of them run away, and they run away, I think, because they, they, maybe it's, they think it's infectious, or maybe some of those are the people who were kind of feeding off me, yeah. and then when I didn't have any more crumbs to throw, they, but they literally, like, ran. <laughs> like, yeah. So, you know, and now I look at all the bills and, and, and all the complications. Uh, I, I try to keep them as minimal as possible, and I always, I know how quickly it can unravel, too. And I think ego is a big part of it. And that's why it's important for me with my work, especially my photographic work. Uh, it's therapy for me. It's about, you know, we have egos. Um, a, uh, it's something that you can't kill, and you also can't ignore it. A friend of mine, Andrew Harvey, a really amazing author, he describes it as this uh, polyhedra in the back of your head and you have a big sword, and this polyhedra, um, polyhydra, hedra, polyhedra, I don't, you know what I'm saying, multi-headed dragon thing, um, is coming at you. And if you lop off, if you, if, you, if you cut off one head, another one grows back. If you cut off another one, in other words, if you spend all your time trying to assassinate the ego, you're going to be spent and defeated. But, and if you turn your back to it, it's going to get you. So what you do is, you just keep on... I know you're there, you just, yeah. And you have to be vigilant about this. And that takes work, to be vigilant. And so every day, you know, something good happens to you, you better not get to that place where you're like, I'm fucking awesome, <laughs> you know, because that's the dangerous place. So you just, you know, anyway, that's... So I learned a lot from it, yes, transform. I'm sorry, I should be talking to you, but I, I, um, I, I, I was transformed in the sense that uh, I never want to go back to that place. And so I do everything I can to make sure that that doesn't... Uh, I, I never become sort of overwhelmed uh, to the point where that should happen again. Especially with two kids, that would be a bad look. Bad look. Yeah. yeah. Anybody? Hi, uh, Kevin. So um, I'm not sure if, I, if you said it, but what's the current value of your IMA token? Uh, oh, coin? interesting, you should ask. <laughs> and what's the plan you have for, for this? Okay, so I found myself in, a, in an odd position. So I create these 10 million pieces of virtual art. And mechanically, they are identical to a cryptocurrency or some token that some company puts out. And I started getting phone calls from Silicon Valley, from Dubai, from Asia. We'd like to buy 10,000 pieces of virtual art, 20,000 pieces of virtual art. So, you know... I realized, okay, so people want to speculate on some future value of my work. And that's something, well, I think it's something that's quite interesting. Um, but at the same time, that's not what this project uh, is about. And I was also aware, acutely aware, of, uh, you know, the Security and Exchange Commission and their, uh, you know, uh, mission to regulate uh, things that are tokenized. But see, my token doesn't really have a utility. It's, it's art. So I'm sort of outside of that realm. But at the same time, it's kind of freaky because when somebody buys a piece of your work, you don't really have control over it. You don't know if they put it in a cellar, if they hang it on a wall, if they set it on fire, if they trade it for you know, something else. Um, and in the same way, and maybe even more so, with these virtual pieces of me, I really have no control over what happens to them. So with respect to the value... I was selling them for $2 a piece. Uh, you have to understand that every time I do a, a transfer, like if you have a wallet and I want to transfer them to you, you have to pay what's called gas. There's actually an expense to, uh, to moving them. So, uh, but then I realized that, uh, okay, let's make it, they're $7 a piece now. Okay. This is a long story, but they're $7 a piece. But I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not actually, I'm, not, I'm not selling any to anybody in the United States either because uh, I just, I'm a little, I'm a little I, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to maintain. When you have, I, I have thousands of emails, people wanting to buy these things. There needs to be an efficient, elegant mechanism to do this besides me sitting there like, you know, yeah. But it's a story that I guess has a little bit of, you know, runway to it, you know. Kevin. Hello. Hi. 
You're very eloquent and generous in the way you speak Thank about you. your work. Thank you so much. Which uh, makes me feel like I can ask you this very general question. Oh, you're just buttering me up. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned that there were questions that you felt could not be answered by your looking at science, but could be answered in your creating art. What are those questions? They're ontological questions that deal with matters of identity and existence. And so, I mean, I think the easiest way to illustrate it for me, when I'm talking to friends, you know, uh, we still don't fully understand, well, we don't understand at all, the time-space continuum. You know the old thing, if, if, if space did end, what's on the other side of that, all of that, okay. And yet, you have, you have uh, academics at, at, at blackboards, you know, filling it up with, with equations and, you know, attempts at understanding the nature of, uh, of, of cosmic phenomena. And, 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 which, and I see this desperation uh, where scientists are trying, to, are trying to explain away the mysteries of the universe with math. And this is controversial. I've talked about this uh, with colleagues at MIT. And it's, I see that as a, a, a sort of very human futility. Uh, to come up with absolutes when I'm not even sure we're capable of understanding those type of truths. And as I don't believe, well, I just don't think science is necessarily the, the path to those truths. And, and this is something that I feel. And I think through, through art and my own practice uh, of making art, I I come a lot closer to answering these questions around why we are, who we are. The, the, one of the things in particular that, that comes up frequently in my work is where do I end and where do you begin? Or where do you end and where do I begin? That line between, this is why photography for me is so interesting. That relationship between my, myself and the subject uh, and, and being able to see myself in the subject or see all of you in the subject even when you were not in the room. Uh, this is fascinating for me. Um, and, uh, and when that blurs, and when that really blurs, I, I get really excited. You know, the concept of oneness, etc. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that's, that's why. Ontological questions. More questions? Hey, Kevin. Over here. <clears throat> Can you talk a little bit about art that exists purely digitally and doesn't have a physical counterpart and, and obviously your Forever Rose is an example and the, the story there and what you see happening with digital art as a, as a trend. And yeah, th this is something I've been, I've been talking about a lot lately and, 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 and I'm, I'm learning uh, about it from the feedback uh, from the people I discuss this with. Uh, I did a piece called uh, Forever Rose on Valentine's Day um, and uh, again, I don't want to distract with the sensationalism of it. It sold for a lot of money. But, and because it sold for a lot of money, there was probably a lot more attention around it. It was called Forever Rose, and in the press, you did see a photograph of a rose that I took. Something I never expected to do. I never wanted to photograph a rose or thought about it, but uh, in this uh, attempt to... Uh, uh, the, it, we, we, we know that across the globe the rose is a symbol for love. And I wanted to create a token that was some distillate of that, a proxy of the rose, which is a proxy, etc. And so I created a token called Forever Rose. It was a single token divisible by one decimal place, meaning 10 people could take possession of this rose. And it did not have a physical manifestation. Despite the photo of the rose, which did exist, that was not what sold. The purchasers of the, of the token did not get that. They didn't even get a digital, uh, a digital version of it. And I did a press tour in, in Asia around this, and it was in Korea that it was particularly interesting, a three, two, two and a half, three hour uh, conference. And I went through four or five cycles of explaining that that's right, it doesn't have a physical presence. You cannot hang it on the wall. You cannot hold it. And yes, you cannot even view it on your computer screen. You can go and look on the blockchain to verify that you own it. You can look to see where it moves, but you, it's not something you can hold on to. And then after the event, a really well-spoken journalist whose English was impeccable, so I know she understood everything I said, 
she came up to me and she said, I just have one question. And she had her notepad. Is the rose actually on the coin? I, I mean, I, I, I almost passed out. I almost passed out on the coin, I said. Yeah. Okay. And I just, I couldn't even answer. Like, are we really after all of that? Um, so people, that's what I'm trying to illustrate is that people struggle with the concept of immaterial art or art that you can't see. And then I was talking to somebody, a big Bitcoin uh, zillionaire in, in Japan, who said, uh, I just don't understand how something you can't, that you can't hang on the wall and you can't even see it can have value. And I had this ready for him. I said, you value love, don't you? And you can't see that. And somebody pointed out to me the other day, or education. There are a lot of things. And, and, then, and, then, and then if I'm really feeling like I want to prod, I say... Uh, I think you have an unhealthy relationship with the material, you know. But it opens up this discussion about how, how we value and why we value anything. And it, 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 it always comes down to consensus. A group of people get around something, whether it's a Beanie Baby or a, a token or a Lamborghini or life itself. And to a certain group of people, something is, is worth something. So I'm excited about this. So they say, well, what do you get? I say, what do you get? You get to share in the experience. But it doesn't get better than that. So it's a conversation. It's an ongoing conversation that I hope to have many more of. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and yeah, I mean, and again, it comes down to sort of, especially with respect to art, why people buy art. Uh, you, you buy art for a multitude of reasons. You buy it because you... Um, it speaks to you, you buy it because uh, you think it makes you look cooler, uh, social validation, or some people buy it because uh, they think they're going to sell it for more someday. Mm -hmm. That's true. So. Oh. All righty, well, thank you, for everyone, for joining us. Let's give Kevin a round of applause. Thank you. We'll be doing our next panel in the next five minutes or so. Thank you.